On December 7, 1941, Japanese planes made a surprise evasion from aircraft carriers on Pearl Harbor. After two hours of bombing, 21 U.S. ships were sunk or damaged, and 188 U.S. aircrafts were destroyed. This resulted with over 2,400 Americans who died, and around 1,000 civilians who were wounded in the attack. This was a time of ultimate grief and terror for the people who have experienced it. Although many have lost their lives and are remembered for their honor and sacrifice today, I'm here to talk about a story of three sailors who have experienced the most terrifying last 16 days of their life. At first, everyone thought it was a piece of loose rigging slapping against the wrecked hull of the USS West Virginia. To the survivors on land, it was just another noise emitted from the carnage of Pearl Harbor, a day after the December 7, 1941 attack. Like the sounds of fireboats squirting water on the USS Arizona, or the hammers chipping into the overtuned hull of the Oklahoma. But they realized the grime truth the next morning, in the quiet dawn. Someone was still alive, trapped deep in the forward hull of the sunken battleship. The Marines standing guard covered their ears. There was nothing anyone could do. When salvage crew raised the West Virginia six months later, they found the body of three men huddled in the airtight storeroom. Ronald Edcott, age 18, Clifford Olds, age 20, and Louis Buddy Coasted, age 21. But the most haunting discovery was the calendar. Sixteen days had been crossed off in a red pencil. The young sailors had marked their time, not knowing what had happened to their ship or that their country was at war. For 55 years, their story has been told in a hushed tone among the West Virginia survivors. It has become a symbol of courage and perseverance for these aging men. Few people knew the whole truth. The Navy never told the families how long their loved ones had survived. And for those brothers and sisters who eventually found out, the truth was so devastating they kept it a secret, even from their own parents. In the days after the attack, Jack Frank Miller often found himself praying on the dock near the sunken West Virginia. He had met Clifford Olds at boot camp. Both were from a small prairie towns in North Dakota. They liked fishing and motorcycles, ships and open seas. Now they were serving together on the same boat. They had been drinking a beer at Pearl City Tavern, the Monkey Bar, the night before the attack. A woman snapped their picture with a third sailor. Olds was smiling, toasting to his friends, a camel cigarette dangling from his fingers. Miller just knew Olds was still alive down there probably trapped in the airtight freshwater pump room, waiting to be rescued. But the ship had taken at least six torpedoes and two bombing, burned for 30 hours, and settled in the mud of the harbor bottom. Its main deck covered in oily water. Cut a hole to get some out and you'd flood the whole thing. Use a torch and risk explosion. Miller knew what that meant for his friends. His days are numbered, he thought. I'm afraid it's going to be a lingering death. He returned to the monkey bar and found the woman who took the picture. She gave Miller the negative. Miller now is 75 living in Seattle. He still has the photo, a memento, of a friend he'll never see again. Friends, frozen in time, on the last night of peace. The Auburn Dean Daily World 
Ronald Edcott hometown newspaper in Grays Harbor County declared him dead on December 17, 1941. Died for U.S., his obituary read, Ronald Edcott, young Auburn D. Navy man, was killed in the war in the Pacific. Edcott was the son of Mr. and Mrs. R.B. Edcott of Auburn Dean. A photo showed a dimpled baby-faced boy in a sailor suit. Nothing was said of Pearl Harbor, the West Virginia, or the noise that still rang from its hall that same day, thousands of miles away. No one wanted guard duty that put him within earshot of West Virginia, especially on quiet nights. They would do anything to trade posts so they wouldn't have to hear the desperate, almost tireless cry for help. God, I can't go by that ship anymore, a buddy told Marine Dick Fisk. But there was Fisk, a sentry on Ford Island, with a thought that he could not shake. Just can't believe someone is still in there. He used to stand watch with Clifford Olds. These were just normal guys. Fisk thought, just like him, they used to gossip about their time in port, drink a beer now and then, talk about girlfriends back home, worry about their threat of war, trade letters. If I don't make it, mail this. What were those men thinking now? He was pretty sure he knew. The same thing had raced through his mind the day of the attack, as he stood in the navigation bridge. Family, his mom and dad, what the future held, God. And one more thing, surely they had asked it a thousand times, does anyone up there hear us? After months of picking bodies from the West Virginia, sailors removed the remains of three men from storeroom A111, clad in their blues and jerseys. They were carried away in a heavy canvas bag drawn tight at the top. The clues left in the dry storeroom hinted at a horrifying demise. Flashlight batteries littered on the floor, the manhole to a supply of fresh water had been opened. Emergency rations have been eaten, and the calendar, a foot high, 14 inches long, a red X scratched through the dates from December 7th through December 23rd. Word spread quickly of its discovery. The survivors couldn't believe it, especially Fisk. As he watched the bodies brought out, now we know how long they were in there. Spurred by the death of his brother, Harlan Costin joined the Navy in October 1942 when he turned 17. He was assigned to the USS Tuscaloosa in the South Pacific, far from his family in Southern Indiana. A friend was serving on the refurbished West Virginia in the same fleet. He told Harlan the truth of Louis, but Harlan couldn't bring himself to tell their mom or younger sister. All they knew came from a Navy man who appeared at the door in the middle of the night several days after the attack. Louis died at his battle station. When the salvage crew searched his locker, they found a watch he already bought his mom for Christmas. It was broken and waterlogged, but the Navy sent it to Effie Costin anyway. She had it repaired and worn it until she died in December 1985. She was 92 years old. Louis' sister, Edna Heal, first learned the truth about his death from a reporter last week. It is so sad, it just breaks you up. Her brother Harlan, now 70, had kept his secret. I just wanted to spare them from grief, he said, fighting tears. Duke Olds had learned the real story about his brother, Cliff, from their cousin, a sailor assigned to the shipyards in Bremerton, where the West Virginia was repaired. He told his other brother and two sisters, but not their parents. It would be too much for them. 
especially Dad. He and Cliff were close. Cliff, that tough little rascal, he loved to pick a fight, but he always got licked because he was so small. He made $21 a month in the Navy, but sent 18 of it home to Mom. She put it in a war bond, saved every penny. Duke's old mother, Jane, died in 1956. His father, Nathan, died 15 years later. Duke kept his promise. They never learned the truth. I never even told it to my wife. The calendar, sent to the Chief of Naval Personnel in Washington, D.C., after it was found, is now lost. Ronald Edcott and Buddy Costin are buried at the National Memorial Cemetery of the Pacific at Punchbowl Crater in Honolulu. Cliff Old's body was returned to his hometown and buried in the city cemetery. All their headstones say they died on December 7th, 1941.